Oh, it's good to be together. Thank you for being a part of our worship this weekend. Church family, it's always good to be with you. It's good to see you. I hope it's been a great Thanksgiving weekend with family and friends, uh, and uh, or week rather, and I trust that as we head into uh, this Christmas season, which Sean now has officially placed on all of us, uh, that uh, it will be just a precious time for you as a family, individually, and for us as a church family. Guests, thank you for being with us. Uh, my name's Adam. I'll add my welcome to Sean's just a moment ago. And uh, we are thankful you're here. Thanks for coming in. Know that it takes uh, some courage and a little bit of risk involved. And we've been praying for you that God would meet with you in a powerful way. If you know Christ uh, and don't have a church home, that this would be the one that you would know that he had placed you in. And if you don't know Christ, that you would meet him here. That's what we've been asking God to do through every element, through the welcome as you came in and uh, through our time together in this room. And then as we leave here, all of it, we're praying God would use it to encourage you. Welcome to those who are joining us online as well, family members who are away. We miss you. We look forward to your return. I know some of you want to be here and can't be. We really are praying for you and are eager for our reunion. And some of you are getting away for a little bit of time. We're happy about that. Happy you get some rest and recuperation time. Trust that you will come back refreshed and uh, jump back in with us here in our life together as a family. Guests who are joining online, checking us out, kicking the tires that way. We're happy you are, but we hope it leads, if possible, to you coming and joining with us here in the worship center. Uh, there's nothing like the gathering of God's people. So thank you for joining in with us that way, and we look forward to meeting you very soon. Whether you are online or in the room here, let's all grab Bibles and open them up to John chapter 17. Guests, you can join us too. If you didn't bring a Bible with you or don't have it on your device, we've got one for you to borrow. It's a hardback black copy of the Bible underneath of a seat nearby and page 849 will get you to John 17 with us. And I would invite you to open it there. We take the word of God really seriously here and would love for you to join us in the Bible. And if you don't own a Bible, that's why you didn't bring one, then take that one home. It's a gift. We would love for you to have it, and uh, you can borrow it today. It's now yours. Put your name in it. Bring it back with you next weekend. And uh, I know that God will work. If you'll engage with his word humbly, he will work through the word. It never returns void. It always accomplishes what he has purposed for it to do. So join us on page 849 in that black hardback copy in John chapter 17. We are marching our way through John's gospel, and uh, actually today we are finishing, we're wrapping up uh, our segment, our season of our consecutive studies in John. We're going line by line, paragraph by paragraph through it, and uh, we'll take our break now for uh, the rest of the month of December, and then we'll come back and uh, kick back off, Lord willing, in January in chapter number 18. Remember that every single paragraph of John's gospel, not first a chronological history, but rather a compiled argument to win you to believe. Every sign and all of the teaching that goes around it, all the conversations that are had are intended to convince you that Jesus is the Christ. That is a Greek word for the Hebrew concept of Messiah, the anointed one, and he is the son of God, the one and only capital S, eternally existent, uncreated, second person of a triune God who took human flesh, was tempted in every way like us as a human being, but did not sin so that he might lay down his life on the cross and make an atonement, make a payment, a substitution payment for our sin. Rose victorious from the dead three days after he died, never to die again, conquering sin and death so that all who place their faith in him might receive righteousness through his perfect obedience credited into our account total and complete and eternal forgiveness of every sin through his infinite sacrifice and glorious victory over sin and death, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. So John said he wrote all these signs under the superintending work of the Holy Spirit so that we might believe that Jesus is the savior for our soul. He's the Christ and he is the son of God. And in believing that we may have life in his Name. That's why we're calling our series Life in His Name, because that is our sweet privilege as the followers of Jesus today and for eternity. Now, when we get to John 17, uh, we are in a very, very important segment. Jesus is praying out loud. There are only 11 disciples left. True disciples are with him. The one false disciple, Judas Iscariot, is betraying him. 
Jesus is praying out loud and extendedly so, so that the disciples hear him. And one of those disciples, the apostle John, under the superintending work of the Spirit, some 50, 60 years later, is writing down for us the very words of that prayer for the same purpose for which Jesus prayed them out loud. He prayed them out loud so that the disciples would hear what he prayed and would be able to align themselves with how he prayed as he approaches the final hours of his life before his crucifixion on Golgotha's hill. So as we engage with John 17, we are privileged to listen to Jesus, the Messiah, and the Son of God pray for us. Pray for his true disciples. He prays the priority prayer of what he wants most in his crucifixion to be glorified. He prays the identity prayer. He prays about the disciples, in front of the disciples, to the Father, so the disciples would hear him and be able to align in the identity that he is praying over them. And then he prays the provision prayer as he asks the Father to keep all true disciples and to sanctify, to change them, the provisions that are most necessary, the ultimate provisions have been made. And so today we come to the end, the final paragraph and oh, how sweet it is to hear what Jesus has in this segment of his prayer. Disunity has been the constant human experience since the Garden of Eden. Since the fall of humanity through sin, Cain and Abel embodying the wholeness, the fullness of disunity in murder, it has been our common experience to live in various levels of and experiences of disunity. But through the work of Jesus Christ, we as true disciples, if in fact you have placed your faith alone in Christ alone, trusting his works for your salvation, not your own or anyone else's, we have come to be a people not of this world. We are from another world. We are already a part of a kingdom of heaven. We are already marked by traits and attributes. We are already, we're not yet, the culmination has not yet come. We have not seen him face to face, and yet already we're living in the kingdom of heaven. Understand? So as we listen this morning, as we tuck in together and listen to Christ, let's be compelled by Christ. Let's be moved by Christ as he prays now. This is what we'll call the oneness prayer. He prays for our oneness as his people, the oneness prayer. In verses 20 down through verse number 26. Now up to this point, Jesus has been praying directly for the 11 true disciples and indirectly we as true disciples have benefited from it. But now in verse 20, it will change and he will pray not directly for the 11 and indirectly for us, but directly for us and indirectly for the 11. And so we gain such a privilege to have these words preserved for us by the spirit beginning of verse 20. I'm gonna read them out loud. You can follow along there in your seat. Online, you join us as well, reading there silently wherever you are. And let's remember as we read, these are God's words for us. The Spirit inspired these words as John remembered what Jesus prayed. And he says this, Jesus says this in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, that's the 11, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that's us. Every generation of believers. Verse 21, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, the glory that you've given me, I've given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. These are the words of Christ, the prayer of Christ for us this morning. May the Spirit of God help us to get them and to be gotten by them, the oneness prayer. If you're jotting down notes or putting stuff in your note app, and I hope that you will, it'll help you to study now and to remember later 
You could grab this big idea that sits over top of this paragraph. True disciples are compelled by the prayer of Jesus for us to observable and profound oneness. The unity that Jesus is praying for in the true disciples that will believe the apostolic gospel delivered by the 11, the unity that he's praying for is an observable and profound unity. It is not theoretical. It is not merely futuristic. And though many of you may have a hard time believing that believers, that Christians can be unified, it is exactly the intention in the prayer of our Lord Jesus for our lives. So may the Spirit of God help us now to be compelled as we should be. We're not merely listening and nodding our head. We're listening and coming underneath of and submitting to the desires of our Lord Jesus as he prays on our behalf. So what makes this oneness profound? Well, there are seven elements that make seven. You heard it right. I said seven Seven elements that make this profound. Listen, Jesus does the same thing he's always been doing in this prayer. He has not merely prayed the thing and then put a period. He has not merely prayed, keep them, sanctify them, and put period. He's filled out layers in his words out loud so that the disciples would listen and gain perspective of what it means. What's going on in that? How, how profound is this? And when he prays now for our oneness, he does not merely pray for all those who will believe through the eleven's word that they may all be one, period. He adds layers to the oneness that he's praying for because it is profound. It is mind-blowing. So we do well to take in these seven elements as I... As I preached this last night, I thought of that little scene in uh, the movie, The Patriot, right at the beginning where Mel Gibson's character leans up against a tree and uh, he says, Lord, make me fast and accurate. That's been my prayer. That's what I've been praying. Lord, help me now to be fast and accurate. Get your pens ready. Carpal Tunnel will be back this week. Let's write them down. Everyone, everywhere should see these elements of our oneness. They are profound. Number one, we have divine oneness. Jesus does not pray that we may all be one in verse 21 and then add to it as much as we can figure out how to be one. He does not say, may they all be one as far as they can get on the same page. He doesn't give us some kind of framework to, to give us an, an allowance for like, well, this is just gonna be a human thing. It's gonna be a human experience. It's gonna be a human experiment. No, it's not that at all. This is rooted in the gospel transformation that Christ has done in us. We have been born again. We have been regenerated by the spirit. So now Jesus prays with these profound, enormous standards and basis for our oneness. He says, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Loved ones, that is inner Trinitarian unity that is the basis and standard for our oneness as the body of Christ. That means that our engagement together with other believers, other true disciples, Jesus is praying for it based upon the inner Trinitarian unity and oneness of the Father and the Son, an unbroken and an unblemished unity that is eternal. The ESV Study Bible adds this really helpful little note. Uh, if you don't have a study Bible, the ESV Study Bible is a great one. It has this little note that, that highlights the elements of the oneness between the Father and the Son in the inner Trinitarian Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mystery they have the same mind. They are one in mind. They are one in purpose. They are one in goal. They are one in love. They are one in mission. They are marked by absolute oneness and unity in the thoughts that they think. They think the same. Their purposes are the same. Their goals are the same. Their love is the same. Their mission is the same. Loved ones, listen to me. When Jesus prays for us, listen carefully to what he's praying. As skeptical as you may be about oneness happening within the body of Christ, you've got scars to prove it's a rough road. Listen to him. It's just as he and the Father are one, and we with them, we 
in him have received the benefit of the supernatural work of the spirit so that we might have a divine oneness. It is a profound thought to think that we will stand out as being not of this world and from an otherworldly place in the way we relate to each other. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, Jesus said when he washed the disciples' feet just a few minutes ago in the upper room, John 13 and verse 35, that you love one another. This is a disciple love, and it is a divine oneness. Nobody gets to opt out of this. I don't know how you think of your discipleship, but none of us can say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'd like to opt out of the union, unity thing. I'm, I'm going to be out of that. I'd like to set aside the oneness part. It's too hard. It's too challenging. No, this is our, this is our calling. And our Savior is praying for this with the divine oneness as the standard for us. We reflect the perfect unity of the Father and Son in our relationship to one another as true Disciples, that's the first element that makes it profound. Here's the second one. Everyone everywhere should see in us as Christ church family and in us as followers of Jesus, we have a missional oneness. This part of the prayer is loaded with so that statements, with purpose statements. Jesus prays and puts purposes connecting to all of his thoughts. Notice what he says in verse 21 so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The world there being both Jews and Gentiles. Every time you run into the word world, we have to consider what he's talking about. He's not talking about the cosmos. He's not talking about the planet. He's not even talking about the mass of unredeemed humanity that makes up the human race. He's speaking there of the world believing as in Jews and Gentiles believe all the nations from every tribe and tongue and nation, all the cultures, all the backgrounds. And how will they come to believe? They will come to believe through the testimony of Jesus Christ, the gospel, that he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, on the backdrop of the unity of the people of Jesus Christ. Perhaps, perhaps, one of the reasons why we have not seen a powerful move in the, in the mission is because the backdrop of the unity of the body of Christ has been so distorted. Listen to Jesus pray now and be compelled toward this profound oneness. It is missional in focus. It is so that unbelievers from all the nations will become believers because the believers are unified and are declaring the good news of the gospel that saves. That's what that purpose statement is saying. Which leads me to a quick warning. Quick warning. I am concerned for us. In the culture in which we live, there are brothers and sisters in Christ who are seemingly consumed with subdividing the body of Christ. Pursuing any and all distinctions and trying to divide up everybody and to get us not unified, to get us not one. It seems to be like a high virtue. I, I don't know what you call that, like a hyper discernment movement where it's just like every little nitpicky thing is intended to subdivide the body of Christ further. I just want to warn you that is not in keeping with the perfect oneness that Jesus is praying for in John 17. Okay, be careful with that. Be careful with those influences that are leading you further and further away from unity inside of the diverse body of Christ. That's the second element. Here's the third one. Everyone everywhere should see number three. We have a glorious oneness. Go back to your Bible in verse 22. Jesus prays, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them so that they may be one even as we are one. Say, how in the world are we ever going to be one? I mean, maybe you're thinking about the people sitting right next to you that are Christians that you know, and you're like, yeah, it ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. And then you're thinking about the people sitting across the room from you, like, how are we ever going to be one? I mean, there's going to be no sense of division. How is that unity ever going to take place? It's going to be because there's a glorious work of God in us. The glory that the Father gave the incarnate Son, the incarnate Son has transferred to all of the true disciples. That is, a, that is a profound thought. You say, oh, I don't really know what to do with that. What does that mean? How do I know that? Listen to me. I think there are three elements that help us with this. The glory of the incarnate Son is his ongoing and perfect relationship to the Father. 
Secondly, it is the direction and leadership of the Holy Spirit who indwelt the Son at his baptism and led him faithfully through his earthly ministry. And thirdly, it is the revelation of the character of God delivered through the Son's word. And Jesus has repeatedly said that. So here, here, listen. The glory that the Father gave to the Son, the Son has given to the true disciples to have a relationship that we should not have with the Father. To be led by the Holy Spirit when we do not deserve to be led by the Holy Spirit and to know the perfect revelation of the character and the name of the Father through the Son that we should not know so that we would be one. So wherever you find true disciples, you will find people who have a relationship to the Father through faith in the finished work of the Son, who are led by the Holy Spirit, and who are under the authority of the Word delivered through the Christ. It's a glorious oneness. I don't know if you've considered it, but when Jesus prays this, he's praying it for you, Christian. And he's saying he gave you the glory. Not just the 11, but all those who would believe because of the word of the 11. It is a glorious oneness. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the phrase, trust fund baby. I thought about asking how many of you were one, but I didn't think you would want to raise your hand. Because we use that negatively, don't we? That's why we don't ever let them grow up. We don't say trust fund man or trust fund woman. We just say trust fund baby. Why? Because in their infancy, they already had wealth because somebody else had earned it and put it aside for them. A trust fund baby is a baby who will have wealth that he has not worked for. He will grow up with benefits and blessings and privileges that he did not work for. They were just given to him. Loved ones, listen to me. As negative as that concept is culturally, perhaps, to us, it is our glorious reality in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are spiritual trust fund babies, okay? We have not earned anything we have. We've been given everything we have. Our inheritance is through Christ. So when the Messiah prays that we would be one, he prays that it would be because of the glory that the Father gave him in the incarnation that he has delivered to the true disciples. Therefore, unity. That's the basis of our unity. It's a divine oneness. It's a missional oneness, the backdrop of us declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is glorious. Don't miss it. It is a glorious oneness. And we need confidence that this could be our experience, don't we? How many of you have been a believer for longer than five years? Longer than five years. Okay, a lot of you. See, we need confidence that we could ever be one, right? Five years in, don't you know it will be a struggle? Don't you know it will be difficult? Won't you know, don't you know that it will be at times painful to be a part of the body of Christ? And yet here our Messiah is praying for us to be one, even as the Father and the Son are one, so that people would believe the gospel because of the glory that has been given to us. This is not a pipe dream. This is not a pipe dream. This is the prayer of the sovereign one of heaven and earth. Amen? I wrote down pipe dream in my notes and then I got to thinking what that must mean. Why do we say that? I thought it was from the 1960s. It's actually from the 1870s, but it holds up. It's the term, the term pipe dream came into use to describe the hallucinations of a person experienced while under the influence of opium. 60s, you get it. This is not that. This is not some kind of wild delusion. This is the prayer of our Christ. His full intention for us, that we might hear him, be compelled by him to an observable and profound oneness. Number four, everyone everywhere should see in us that we have a Christian oneness, a Christ-centered oneness, a Christ-exalting oneness. What Jesus prays next in verse 23 is Christiocentric. It is all about Jesus and then his relay to us. It is all about Christ and his mediation for us. There is one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, and he prays that way. Look at what he says in verse number 23. I in them... Jesus in us and you in me, Father and Son, that they may become perfectly one 
That is the progress we should assume will be taking place so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, the true disciples, even as you loved me. We're loved by the Father because the Father loved the Son and we're in the Son through faith in his finished work for us. We are the recipients of all the work of Christ on our behalf. Our anticipation of becoming perfectly one is directly linked to the work that the Christ is doing in us. So listen to me, this is a definitively Christian, I don't mean that vaguely, I don't mean that superficially, I mean that in the most technical terminology. This is a Christ-centered oneness. And listen, there's a second warning that I have for you. There are people who are subdividing us to death. But there are also people who are seeking to deceive us into a false, an arbitrary, an artificial, and a counterfeit oneness. Many of them using John 17 to break down the Christ-centeredness of our oneness. Listen, anywhere where the person and work of Christ is altered, anywhere where the gospel of faith alone and Christ alone, by God's grace alone, is altered, there is no unity available. There's none. Do not allow yourself to be duped into thinking that though the terms are the same and the definitions are different, that we can be unified. No, it is one Christ as revealed in the word and one gospel as delivered by the apostles, period. And only there is unity found for us. We are loved because we are in him. We are known because we are in him. We are Christian in our Unity. So oneness is exalting the true Christ and the true gospel. There's only one gospel. Galatians 1 9, Paul said, if he preached or if an angel preached any other gospel, let them be damned. That's what he preached. And there is only one Christ. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Just to get started. He is the eternal, uncreated creator of the universe who took on humanity and was fully God and fully man. Tempted but never sinning so that he might lay down his life, not as an example of dying unjustly, but as an atonement, a payment for sin. That he may take his life back up in resurrection glory three days after he died, conquering sin and death the consequence of sin, so that all who place their faith in him might receive salvation through his work entirely for us. There's one gospel and there's one Christ. We have a Christian oneness. We love all our neighbors, but we can only be one with those who are with us in the once delivered faith through the gospel, exalting the one and only Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen? Hey, this is true for your marriage. This is true for your parenting. This is true for your small group. This is true for our church family. This is true for the global church here on earth. This is true everywhere. Our interactions with other believers come up. It must be Christ-centered. It must be gospel-centered in the truth. Okay, that's the fourth one. Here's the fifth one. Oh, Lord, make me fast and accurate. Number five, everyone everywhere should see we have hopeful oneness. Ours is not merely a pursuit of oneness on this earth, but look at what Jesus prays out loud for us to hear him. Father, verse 24, I desire that they also whom you have given me, that's the way he talks about the true disciples, may be with me where I am. That's heaven. To see my glory that you've given me because you've loved me before the foundation of the world. That's eternality. He's dropping this kind of hope. On this side of the cross, Jesus is before his cross, praying out loud, knowing what's coming in the cross, knowing what's coming after the cross and his glorious resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father. He's already praying with our hopeful oneness that we might be a people unified and perfectly unified in the truth of who he is and in the truth of the gospel that brings us to him so that we might be with him in heaven. The day of reunion is coming. It's coming. We're going to be with him. And when we're with him, we'll see his glory. I don't know if you've ever engaged with the places in your Bible where that takes place, but uh, Matthew chapter 17 is the first one I'd give you, and Revelation 1 is the second one. 
Matthew 17, we call that the Mount of Transfiguration. He, he let three of his disciples see what it would be like to see him in heaven. And they were overwhelmed. You remember that? They didn't know what to do, so Peter just started talking. <laughs> remember that? He said, let's build tents. Let's stay here. This is good. What's happening here is good. And the Father spoke from heaven and said, be quiet. In Revelation 1, the Apostle John, who's recording the prayer of Jesus in John 17, sees his Lord and his closest friend during his earthly ministry, and he falls on his face as a dead man. Why? Because the hope will be to see his glory. And to see his glory will be because he has been loved by the Father since before the foundation of the world. That is before anything was. There's no start date to the love of the Father for the Son. He has always loved the Son. Theirs is an eternal unity. Listen to me. In the pursuit of oneness, even as a church family, it will be hard. It will be tough. It will require us to obey verses that say to forgive each other. It will require us to obey verses that say to bear with one another. Why does the Bible say we need to bear with one another? Because of what it's like to be with us. That's why. Sometimes you're going to have to stay with it. I am now obeying the verse, bear with you. Some of us will forgive. We'll have to confess and then be forgiven. Some will forgive and then have to re-forgive. Have you ever done that? You've forgiven. And then it's like some time went by. It's like it, it expired. You're like, I don't think I'm forgiving anymore. I need to reapply forgiveness so that the oneness is here. Listen, here's the hope in it. Here's the hope in the battle. Here's the hope in the struggle. Here's the hope in our pursuit of this for the sake of the mission and the glory of God. The hope is there will be a day when all of this will be made right. Everything will be perfect. It will all culminate. The unity will be sweet and it will be effortless. I've started to do some running a little tiny bit of running. It's been a wheezing near heaven experience for me. <laughs> but here's the thing, when you run, people who run, you runners out there, you always tell us who don't run, that it, it gets better. It'll get better. Just keep doing it. Be consistent and it'll get better. I don't know if I believe you, but I'm banking on you being right. Perhaps unity has been hard and it's been painful. It's been missing. I want to encourage you that Jesus prays with hopeful oneness on his heart that there will be a day of reunion. Pursue it, protect it, be an agent of peace and oneness within the true disciples, within the true body of Christ. And there is comfort that heaven is coming in our divisions, our partial restorations, and our walk of forgiveness as his people with each other, okay? All right, that's the fifth one. Here's the sixth one. Everyone everywhere should see that we have gracious oneness. Now, this is a concept. It's not in verse 25 as a word, but I want, you to, I want you to see the concept. It's clearly there. Notice the word that Jesus uses before he says father. Do you see that? Oh, what father? Oh, righteous father. Anytime you see the word righteous connected to God, you ought to have some sense of dread that hits your heart. He is righteous. He is just. And he's holy. And his justice must be doled out. And then Jesus adds to that righteous father, even though the world that is the mass of unbelieving humanity does not know you. And that adds another layer to our recognition. And then he says, I know you. And then he says this about us. I know you. And these know you, know that you have sent me. Listen, here's the grace in the oneness. Here is the great leveling of the playing field. We didn't know, but now we know. We did not have a relationship to God, and now we do. We did not know the truth, and now we do. We did not see the glory of Christ, but now we do through faith. We did not hear the message of the gospel was for our salvation. Now we do. We do. How did that happen? Grace. Why do I know grace? It was not because we were smarter. It was not because we worked our way into it. It wasn't because we earned our way up into understanding. It is all grace. This is a unity that is rooted in the grace of God to us, the sovereign grace of his purpose to make sinners see 
to make dead hearts alive to faith in Christ. This is a gracious oneness. This is matching Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. He speaks so much of our spiritual deadness upon arrival. And in verse number 4, two of the sweetest words in all of your New Testament, but God. But God, being rich in mercy, he saved us. His grace is sufficient for us, and we have grace as our basis of union and oneness together. So there's no earning in the body of Christ. Amen? Okay? There's no superstars in the body of Christ. Amen? Church of Corinth got into that. Paul dealt with it. There's just grace. So where disunity is the easy play and unity is the hard work, bring grace to the table. That true disciple that you're struggling to have oneness with has been a recipient of the same grace that you've received, indwelt by the same Holy Spirit that you're indwelt by, granted the same revelation of the word of God that you have been granted, marked by the same inheritance earmarked for the same inheritance in heaven that is yours, grace. Grace sets the table for our oneness. It is a gracious work of God to make us one. Okay, here's the seventh. Everyone everywhere should see we have covenant oneness. This also is conceptual from verse 26. We have an agreement with God through faith in Christ. It is the new covenant long awaited, no longer the blood of bulls and goats, no longer the constant sacrifices. No, this is the covenant relationship accomplished through Christ and faith in him that is ours. And look at what happens in our covenant relationship to God. Verse 26, Jesus says, I made known to them your name. We know God. We know God and I will keep making it known. I love that. I love that encouragement. It is not merely that we have met God. It's that Jesus is faithful as our Messiah to continue our knowledge of the name. We know God. Secondly, look at what it says. That the love with which you have loved me may be in them. Romans 5, 5, the love of God has been poured into us. In the covenant relationship we have with God, we know God and we didn't know him. In the covenant relationship with God, we're loved by God, and we love with the love of God that we did not have. And then it really culminates at the end of verse 26, and I in them, the indwelling presence of God through the ministry of the Spirit of Christ in us, the Holy Spirit, Christ with us. This is the covenant oneness that's ours. We know his name. We know his character. We know God. And we are loved by God, and we have the love of God in us with which we love one another. And Christ is in us the hope of glory through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit who exalts the Christ in all of the true disciples. <laughs> I know, we're used to it. I know, we're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Are you kidding me? We're in a covenant with God. <laughs> Do you know in the old covenant, there was one day where one high priest would go into the one little room called the Holy of Holies to have the Shekinah presence of God there with him. And he would go in there with bells on his garment and a rope tied around his waist that ran out of the room because if he went in there with any sin in him that had not had an application of an animal sacrifice by faith, the bells wouldn't jingle anymore because he'd be dead and the rope would be used to pull his body out. We're not waiting for the Shekinah glory to come once a year to one person who's a leader for us spiritually. We are indwelt by the very presence of God, each and every one of us, permanently and presently and perpetually for the glory of Jesus Christ. It's a covenant, and it makes us one. We are so different, but we are so the same. We're so different in the body of Christ, which is the beautiful plan of God. We were not a people, but now we are a people. We weren't a nation, but now we're a holy international nation of exiles waiting for our king to return. We weren't family. Now we're brothers and sisters through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We weren't in the will. Now we're co-inheritors of the inheritance of heaven, which cannot rot, won't be stolen, 
and is being preserved for us on the day that we meet him face to face. Everything is new. We have a divine oneness, missional oneness, glorious oneness, Christian oneness, hopeful oneness, gracious oneness, and a covenant oneness. May this be a life lived for the pursuit of unity here at Christ Church. Christian marriages, may this be the way you live as one. Christian parents, as one with your Christian children, if you have them. Christian children toward your Christian parents, if you have them. Small groups and ministry teams and our local assembly and all of the local churches that we meet that are true disciples preaching the true gospel of the true Christ. May we be purveyors and preservers of the oneness that Jesus, our Messiah, prays for in John chapter 17 so that there might be a backdrop for the message to go out with power. Okay, we don't learn to learn here, we learn to live. So jot these little phrases down and take them home. Number one, I must be one with Christ. That is the underlying biggest issue. Are you one with Christ? Have you been united to Christ? Say, I don't know how to do that. How do I get united to Jesus? It's only through faith in what he's done. It is the confession that you are a sinner and that none of your works will get it done and your confidence crying out to him in faith. He will save you. You will be united to him and you will become a part of his people. Come with us, friend. The offer stands for you today, just as you are, to come to Christ and be united through faith to his finished work. It is your greatest need. It is your eternal need. Number two, church family, I must be compelled by Christ as opposed to all the other voices that compel me. That's what I'm after. Would you think through, it's not that we don't know John 17 is in our Bible and it's not that we don't even know what Jesus prays. Perhaps that's you, but for many of you, you know that he prayed this. It's that it's not compelling you toward it because his voice is not loudest. Would you consider who's getting the most airtime for you? Who's most influential? We must be compelled by Christ. Lastly, I must go out for Christ. Every engagement with the body of Christ locally, extra locally, internal to our local church, internal to our homes where the gospel is present, we are for Christ. Every stranger, we're for Christ. Every spiritual family member, we're for Christ and for the oneness that he's praying for. May the spirit of God bring this rare jewel of our otherworldliness into our lives in this next season so that we might be the backdrop for the testimony of the finished work of Jesus so that many in the world may believe that he is the Christ. Amen? All right. Father, do it, please, help us. Spirit of God, help us. Jesus, may you be exalted. We're concerned for compromise. On either front, a refusal, rejection, or laziness with our unity, or a false unity without the truth of who Christ is and the gospel that saves. Would you help us? to be protectors of our bond, of our oneness, peacemakers, pursuers of this oneness that our Lord Jesus prays for. Help us. We pray for our friends that do not know him, that you would draw them to him now, that they might see themselves for who they are and who he is as the savior for their soul. Father, with the bread and the cup now, do what you intend it to do, reminding us of what has been sacrificed and who has died so that we might live. And Jesus, may you be exalted among your people in our worship of remembrance now, we pray in your name, amen.